produces greater uh, talks about hair. We have to comprehend like the coldness of our skin and like just how bad it is for us right. to like really take in all the great things it's offering for us. But I think finding that balance is really hard of like yes, right. acknowledging all of the sin, but at the same time acknowledging all the grace and not just like acknowledging all the sin and letting it change you. Yeah, that's exactly why I have you reading that with Brene Brown. Because Kyle's, <clears throat> I mean, that, that's, that's probably the only criticism I have, is that when he camps there, he invites people to go into shame. So all, because we've heard it all our lives, right? What an awful, wretched sinner you are. And that, I suppose that's true if you're working from Jeremiah 34. <clears throat> You know, the heart's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Except that there, we have this little thing called the New Testament and Jesus and all the other things that really fulfilled the law. And now it's the question of whether what does it mean about my exchanged heart, not my old heart? And what do we do with that? And that's where grace comes in. So that's kind of the problem in some sense. Because I noticed a lot of people that were writing in the, in the journals kind of caught that. <clears throat> and it tempts us back into that way of thinking. And it, while it is true, we'll spend a little time talking about that today, but while that's true, <clears throat> the, the problem that we have, and I've mentioned this, I think I mentioned this last time, is we, we tend to think very categorically, and we tend to think very dichotomously. So if it's not this, it's this, rather than, how do I how do I live in some kind of balance between these things? Better yet, how, not balance because there isn't going to be balance. I mean, I, the minute you walk out of this room, it's not going to be balanced. It's about what do I do with the tension uh, between those things? Because ultimately, the bottom line is is what I do with that tension means that either I separate it into two categories, there I've got it, or I live with the tension. Because the problem with tension is ambiguity, and the problem with ambiguity is anxiety. And I want to resolve the anxiety more than I want to live the abundant life, quite honestly. And, and that comes into the com bigger conversation that we're going to be having at least today. So other observations from the week, things that you've seen, thought, talked to people about, yeah. Yes. And I think that was kind of a hard pill to swallow for me because I was like, I feel like I can talk about vulnerability and make like great universal statements about vulnerability. Yep. But that's not actually being vulnerable. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Which would fit right into the conversation in, in another week about the stained glass self. Another thoroughly uncomfortable week coming your way. <clears throat> <laughs> yes. I think when I came into class, like I was like, I'm not scared. Like I'm fine and I'm ready to bring up all this stuff. And then, like, so much was brought up in literally two classes one week, um, <laughs> and it was kind of scary. I like saw all this just like, just like stuff being brought up that I had pushed down for like years. Mm -hmm. And now I am a little scared. <laughs> so mm -hmm. just a update. That, I, to me, that sounds realistic. The other one sounds a little naive, but you're allowed to be. Anybody else? Any other reactions or anything? I had yeah. a really similar, Go ahead. A really similar experience with Rose, mm -hmm. and I felt myself like as I started to see the fear, like retreat again, and it was really hard to push myself back into the meeting. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because remember, vulnerability and fear are very related. And vulnerability and fear and shame are always related. So, I mean, a part of what keeps us in shame is is fear, uh, and a lot of what we talk about in here that drives us to shame is to manage the disconnection we feel with people. Other reactions? There was a hand back there. Yeah, Casey. Yeah. She said that it's 
called boundary is just closure, and mm -hmm. how it's, that's actually a way to protect yourself from real, real vulnerability. Right. I just thought that was interesting because sometimes you meet people, they're just like, oh, here's my job to secret. They're telling you your entire life story, and you're like, oh. <laughs> right. So just realizing that that's kind of like a way to protect themselves from real vulnerability, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it really is. It's a test. And then you run away and they say See, I, it to themselves, see, I told you so. You're just too much for people. And so we keep this kind of narrative going. So it, it looks like they're being really vulnerable when, in fact, it's defensive vulnerability. And, and that, that ends up kind of being, okay, are you going to step? See, the, the problem is, I, a funny thing, I have these conversations with people. And, <clears throat> and I had this conversation with, a lady this weekend. She's a she's a former missionary to Mongolia, now an ESL teacher in the Jeffco uh, school district, and <clears throat> she she doesn't. We to, what we talked about was it's a real double bind because if people like that do that and you run. They're confirmed in their belief, but they're worse off if you stay <laughs> because they have to confront themselves. See, that's, that's the thing, is that they, in a sense they're setting the stage for you to run away from them and be confirmed in the fact that they're too much for people. But what's worse, all right, and that's bad, that just confirms and continues, but what's worse is if you stay. Because then they have to confront themselves. They can't blame you for running away. They have to look at themselves because you're saying, look, I'm, I'm in. Yeah, I, that's, that's a lot. And that's why a lot of people that come into counseling for the first session, they overshare. <laughs> and then they get scared spitless. I did a really good job at editing that. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, <clears throat> They get scared spitless and they run and they never come back, because the counselor is saying, "Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I, I get it." And they're going, "Oh crap! Now what do I do? Because I've spent my life defining myself as too much, and now here's somebody that says, "No, you're not, not really." So yeah, it's 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 a profound thing, and I think kind of juxtaposing those like Eidelman stuff and, and Brown stuff, they really do very much complement one another because Eidelman's message is let's be really clear about what grace is all about. Let's be really, really clear. And then Brown kind of gives us this perspective about but don't fool yourself about the whole shame stuff because it's always lurking on your doorstep. Always. And no matter what. So, Any other comments? Reactions. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> well, what, uh, let me pray. But what I want, I want to give you a heads up, okay? Because today what I want to cover um, is going to tempt you into a lot of shame. <laughs> Can't wait, huh? That's why I'm going to pray. <laughs> Yeah, right. A mass exodus. See y'all. <laughs> I'll have a good single monologue for myself. Thank you very much. <clears throat> but what I want you to pay attention to as we move into this is what happens when you start thinking about it. Okay? Because I, the, everybody, you know, every, I think... <laughs> When I say the material I want to present is to you, it is not for anybody else. And then you start doing the comparisons and looking back in history and saying, oh, crap, oh, crap, I didn't do that, I should have done that, I could have done that, blah, 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 blah. And the shame train will leave the station and you'll be saying, well, how did I get here? Okay? So pay attention because... A, a lot of folks that have come in, and as I've been reading your journals, a lot of people are saying, yeah, but what do I do? I mean, how do I, how do I respond to other people? I mean, what, how do I do this? And, and this, is, 
this is my answer to you. One of the reasons I do jur- have you guys do journaling because it helps me to know what to teach next. It really does. I, and so I, just on another minor point, I'll just get this out of the way. Um, some of you guys have never written journals for me before. Please, 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 double space, okay? Please. <clears throat> um, Part of the thing that I deal with every day, I think a lot of you guys know this, heard me talk about it before, is just a lot of head pain. And when I have to read a lot of single space stuff, my head explodes, not figuratively, okay? It gets to a point where it feels like somebody's got ice pick in my head because I'm having to strain to look at that stuff. So I would really appreciate it if you would be kind enough to do that. If you aren't, you'll be heartless and kindless and... I'll label you that way. Not really. Not really. Not really. I might talk to you, but that may be even more uncomfortable than me labeling you heartless. So, <clears throat> All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, and thank you just for meeting us and giving us an opportunity for some rest over the weekend. And, and as difficult as it is for us to unpack and understand and look at uh, a lot of this material, Um, Shame may be looking at our door, but grace is pursuing us in you. And I I pray that uh, we take to heart what what Eidelman talked about, about grace pursuing us not to collect on a bill, but to give us something we can't afford. And that's something that we want to grasp and try to understand, not not in the sense of just what it took to establish a relationship with us, which is indeed truly amazing, but what it takes for us to live into that and live out of that as well. So help us to have the courage to do that, uh, the courage to, to live out of our hearts and to look at it honestly and to say, hey, yeah, that's there. I just need to, I need to learn. I need to try to figure out how to do things differently, and that's what we're here for. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the things that I, I have talked about, some of you guys have heard me talk about this before, it will probably be good review, um, <clears throat> is, is this. <laughs> How would you describe a safe person? The longer I have talked, think, thought about this and written about this, the more I've realized that a safe person is a shame-resistant person. It's somebody who resists throwing shame at the other person for one major reason they know where they live they know what their landscape is and they make a guess about that other person that I'm talking to probably is living in the same country I gotta figure out a way to speak freedom rather than shame so That being said, I want to walk into this and talk about this a little bit. The first thing that we start with then is how do we go about describing people that we have relationship troubles with? And this is just a sampling of what people often say. They say, he doesn't listen to me. She's so perfect that I can't, she can't understand my struggles, he or she. He seems so distant that I feel alone. She always tries to control me, he makes promises, but doesn't really... Follow through. He or she is condemning and judgmental. In a lot of ways, we tend to describe people in ways that impact us, that impact us. And in our in the culture we live in today, we have gotten drilled, absolutely drilled, and we bought the idea that we can't exercise any discernment about people because if we do, we're being judgmental. Okay, now take a list like this and then look at how does God describe people that he's in relationship trouble with? And oh, there's another one. Yeah, there's the rest of those. You got that. He describes it this way. They are far away from me or they're unfaithful or they're proud and perfectionistic. Go figure that appears in the Bible, too. They're unloving or or judgmental. See, God describes people by their heart, by the conditions of their heart, the things that, that 
that are there that lay the foundation for certain kinds of behavior. We tend to focus on certain kinds of behavior and then, and then deal with that. But God's always talking about, and you've heard me say over and over again, it's about your heart. Because we, we can talk about, I struggle with anger issues, I struggle with lust, I struggle with a broken relationship, whatever that is. And that's, that's downstream from what's going on in your heart that has laid the foundation for that to happen. And we tend to pay attention to downstream. We don't go upstream to say, what's going on in this well that has produced this kind of stuff? Okay? So what we have to talk about is these two things, is the idea of judgment versus character discernment. And like I said, whenever, and, and you know, if I sat out here by the fireplace and, and was completely anonymous and nobody knew me, I sat in a booth the other day and just kind of freaked people out entirely. It's kind of fun, actually. Um, <clears throat> I would hear a lot of people say, they would kind of confess to another person, you know, I didn't do it quite right, or I should have done it that way, and almost reflexively say, when the other person kind of pushes back, don't judge me. Don't judge me. And when I've, had, I've heard people say that before, even in my presence, and depending on the nature of the relationship I have with them, I say, it's too late, you've already done that. It's not about me. So when we're talking about judgment, we, ha we choose our friendships on outward appearances, but when we're in relationship, we experience the inside of them. And so we don't get much training when it comes to discernment of character. Probably one of the more revealing segments of Scripture that I've taken, I think, most of you guys through is the Sermon on the Mount. It is training in discernment, in character. And so we, we have to realize that discerning somebody's character is not judging them until I make some conclusion with therefore and then some evaluation of some sort. Then it lapses into judgment. But I can discern somebody's character and adjust my behavior accordingly. And this fits right into what, what Brene Brown talks about with, in terms of vulnerability. There has to be mutuality and there has to be boundaries. This is a building block to that. So becoming safe people is part of the key. The only way that we can learn and figure out how to be something different than we are, we have to go through a really, really painful process. We have to look where we actually are. So we can set a goal to where we're going. Well, I better figure out where I am. And that's key. Because if you don't know where, you're, where you are, good luck on figuring out where you want to go. As a matter of fact, if you want to go anywhere, it doesn't really matter what direction you go, right? You're still going to be gone somewhere. <coughs> so we have to understand and start with the nature of where we actually are. That's why I'm saying this material tempts you into shame. Because what was the one differentiating thing, interestingly enough, after I did the poll with you guys, I did the poll again with the, the first section on, on Wednesday, and, and guess what happened? Exactly the same thing. Identity showed up with shame, and it didn't with grace. In the second section, I was, th I was thinking, okay, these guys, you know, whatever. They, they, they are either thinking more penetratingly or whatever. And, and, but then when it showed up in both classes, it was like, wow, wow. Because we see I, our shame as part of our identity, and we don't see grace as part of our identity. Of course, the bigger question might be, if that were true, what does that mean? What does that mean? So what I want to look at is two different things. One, I want to look at the personal characteristics of an unsafe person in order to start laying the, the, set, the stage for what would a safe person look like, okay? 
And a safe person is all about what you do with your heart. And it is not about behavior. Our behavior betrays what we believe. It always will. So you can tell me what you believe, but if I follow you around and watch and interact with you in conversations and everything else, I will probably find what you really believe. And that's, that's fundamentally true. So when you look at this material and we start walking our way through this stuff and you say, ouch, ouch, stop now. <laughs> This is, this is the equipping for becoming the kind of people I think most of you want to be, which is also shame resistant. It's very much a part of that. So let's look at this. <clears throat> so what is an unsafe person? There are three different categories, if you will. Nobody is all one. Nobody is all one of these, okay? But the first one is the abandoners. They begin with promises of companionship, and they begin with commitment, but when things start getting tough and when they are needed most, they bolt. Our propensity when we get close to somebody is make a bunch of promises we can't keep or we probably won't keep. And the reality is, is abandoners oftentimes have experienced abandonment themselves and some little timer goes off in their head that it's about time for this relationship to start to deteriorate and they initiate the deterioration themselves because of course self-induced pain is a whole lot better than other induced pain. And, and in, in talking to people and talking to, to adolescents we have a particular term, it's called um, active mastery. In other words, I'll hurt me before you hurt me because after all you are going to hurt me. And abandoners are kind of in that category. They, they get very, very afraid of this authentic kind of closeness that, that we're talking about with vulnerability. And, and I've, I've seen it over and over and over again. They long to be known. They long to be part of a community. But the minute it starts getting a little too close and people know them a little too well, you know, they're, they're, they're like some cartoon character that bolts out of the frame and all that's left behind is dust. <clears throat> the unfortunate thing about this is, is they leave, leave a wake of people that don't trust in the future. They, they leave a wake behind them, unfortunately. Because people, guess what people say? What do they conclude? Well, what did I do wrong? They don't think about maybe it's the other person's issues that did this, not me. And, and, and there's, there's, there is a place for responsibility. I get it. I do. I very much get it. On the other hand, our propensity is that when something goes wrong, someone must be punished or blamed. And when that happens, the gun usually is always pointed at us. For one main reason, I've got a target with me. I don't have a target with the other person. How do I go after them and say, wait a minute, what, what are you doing? And we won't because they've induced such pain. It's like, why do I want to go through that again? And that's understandable. So abandoners are one group of people. Another group of people are, are fall into the category of what we call critics. Now remember, nobody's all one thing. People can switch around and do different things, but the critics end up taking a parental role with the people they know. They micromanage people for their good. That's usually the rationale. So they, they would fall in this category of being judgmental. Why? Because they speak the truth when they need to say it rather than when that person needs to hear it. And they, they don't have any room. Now, they may not, they may like to talk about grace and forgiveness all the time. They don't have really any room for that because, of course, we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's tough out there. 
So ultimately, they're, they're based on their behavior, they are very much committed to confronting errors than they are with making connections with people. There's a difference between a community that is built on you should, which is detecting errors, to a community that says me too. That's about connection. This is the overlap with what Brene Brown is talking about. <clears throat> Unfortunately for folks that are in this category, they confuse weakness with sinfulness and they're condemned, therefore condemn it condemn others when they have those problems. They may not say it openly because, because of the very topic of this class. They have a collusionary partner, the other person, because the other person is already shaming themselves for all the weaknesses they have and all the difficulties they have. So it doesn't take a whole lot for another person to actually trigger that in, in me, and I'm already feeling like, oh, I am such a loser. I can't ever do anything right. I'll never be, last time, enough, or good enough, or smart enough, or anything enough. Is sinfulness a function of our weakness? Yeah, it is. It is. But there's also a part of our humanity that we fundamentally reject. And by rejecting it, we continue in shame. Because we're not willing to live with ourselves as we are. I mean, the, the funny thing about this, funny, ironic thing about this, is that God is a whole lot more aware and comfortable with your humanity and Jesus is than you are. The only response you have to yours is rejection. The only response he has to yours is grace. So you have the critics. So abandoners, critics, and then we have one other group, and that's the irresponsibles. The irresponsibles are absolutely a blast to be around. They are very much fun. They don't take care of themselves or others. <clears throat> They're the piece of person in the crowd when you utter something like, I feel like doing X, Y, and Z, and the, they're the ones that are saying, do it. They have a lot of problems in delaying gratification. That's not really in their lexicon of working through life and doing life. They don't consider the consequences of their actions, and they don't follow through on commitments, which also gives you a clue that sometimes irresponsibles and abandoners have very similar characteristics. <clears throat> a lot of times, well-meaning, Caring people are drawn to people that are in this category, the irresponsibles. And when they're drawn to this person, you see certain constellation of behaviors. Um, and, and one of them, one of the biggest ones, is making excuses for them. Or being hopeful. They'll get it. They'll get around to doing it. Or whatever it is. <clears throat> But there's a lot of us that feel like because we have been saved, it is now our job to save other people from themselves. And I hate to burst your bubble, but you don't have the power to do it, particularly when somebody wants to sabotage themselves. <clears throat> My wife and I had a, a, a very exciting conversation last night about our small group. We lead a small group at church, and my frustration with our small group has been they, they are people that want to live a water bug life, and I'm inviting them to go deep. And they're allowed to stay there. <clears throat> I invite, but they don't want to go. And that, that's a frustration because I know that they could experience so much more in their relationship with Jesus. But they're unwilling to. They would rather have God in a box and on top of the water than actually feel the confusion and disorientation below the water. Looking at their own hearts and stuff. 
And that's, people are allowed to do that. You can't save people from themselves. A lot of times, God has these subtle sort of ways to get us below the water. But at the same time, he, he's also <laughs> lovingly respectful when we say, no, but out. And he says, okay, all right. You want to see an example of it, read Romans 1. He said, you have no excuse. All you have to do is look at creation to know about me. <laughs> and they say, no, I don't want to. I want to, I want to worship a tree. <laughs> I don't want to worship you because you've got too much control. And he says, okay. And they suffer the consequences accordingly, which is enumerated in Romans. So here are some of the, the behaviors you see, because if you're drawn, you'll pick up after them, you'll apologize to others for them, you'll make excuses, you'll give them chance after chance after chance, you will nag them, and you will resent them. Because oftentimes nagging is a veiled form of anger and resentment. Most of us get into, re, into re, re, relationships with irresponsibles for all the right reasons. All the right reasons. But we do not discern at what point am I trying to save them from themselves rather than let them suffer the consequences. And, in, and Proverbs makes it very clear that in a lot of cases you don't talk, the example in Proverbs is you don't try to convince an angry man you let them suffer the consequences because consequences teaches far better than just spoken words. For somebody who's wise, spoken words help. They, they, they make course corrections. But somebody that doesn't want to do it that way, then there's nothing to, to, to do there. So, Let's look at some personal traits. We're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to look at it from a personal perspective. What this is saying is, what is the interior of the unsafe person? And then we're going to look at, well, how do they relate to people? The interpersonal traits. I mean, if I was really going to be specific, I would call this intrapersonal and interpersonal. Okay? <clears throat> but in a lot of cases... The traits, these personal traits, the uh, unsafe person wants to give the appearance that they have it all together. They end up being religious instead of spiritual. They're committed to appearing spiritual more so than cultivating a messy, tension-filled relationship with Jesus. Where confusion and disorientation comes and goes, there are glimpses of things that that give me hope, and there are glimpses of things that horrify me. Because a relationship with Jesus often acts like a mirror for a reason, <laughs> to draw us closer to him. But they tend to look like they have it all together, and the minute you give them feedback, they get defensive or offended. And what happens to your feedback? Three guesses and two don't count. Nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> and we look at that giving of the feedback and say, well, I, I, how many times have we said this, right? I'm just trying to help. But suddenly I become the problem. I become the one reigning on their parade. I become the issue. Well, what right do you have to tell me about this stuff? I know your life. I know what kinds of stuff you do. How, what standing do you have to say this stuff to me? <laughs> you want to de deflect that? You can say, yep, you're right. <laughs> you want to get into it? I'm happy to talk about it. But they tend to be very defensive, which essentially shuts down feedback, which essentially makes it so they stay the way they are. <clears throat> Some other examples that go into this is, is they're self-righteous instead of humble. What does that mean? It does not mean that they strive on the flip side, okay? 
which is giving you a clue about safe people. They, safe people are not striving to be humble, okay? Humble is a byproduct of other things that the safe person is cultivating. But these guys are self-righteous, and so they're trolling the, the, the environment for all the reasons why they are God's gift to their, your relationship with them. And they only apologize. That's it. They make their apology is basically a promise that they have no intention of keeping. <clears throat> and then they avoid working on their problems instead of dealing with them. They find every excuse not to do anything about some of the feedback you might tr be trying to give them. For, for all the good reasons, for all the positive reasons entirely. I, yeah, it is. I, I, that's wonderful. But just realize that when somebody is trying to give me feedback and I keep pushing them away, there's a reason for pushing it away. And probably what's lurking is shame. I've already condemned me. I can't take hearing any more. Which ultimately makes me, at that moment, unsafe. All right, And that's a very important point to put in your notes. N nobody is consistently safe. There are moments where we're unsafe. It doesn't make somebody completely unsafe. But we're always having to identify these aspects in ourselves, and that's, that's how we go about what? Changing them. Grace creates a space for me to learn and to do something differently. Shame imprisons me and makes me stay where I am. And that's, that's an important aspect that, that we have to keep in mind as we're looking at these. Some other ones, they believe they're perfect instead of admitting their faults. The funny thing about perfectionists are they're, they're, they're more than willing to tell you how imperfect they are, but then they spend all their lives trying to prove that they are. They blame others instead of taking responsibility. They lie instead of telling the truth. It doesn't mean they openly lie. They just end up leaving out information. It's the omission of truth rather than the commission of a lie. And they tend to be pretty stagnant instead of growing. Most of the stories they're telling are of times gone by. You may not ever know that, which is part of the kind of lying thing. <clears throat> But they tend to be pretty stagnant. They're always having the same kind of insights that goes into it. <clears throat> they avoid closeness instead of connecting. <clears throat> there are lots and lots of people, and I would count myself as one of them at one point in time, that I spent all of my career and all my time trying to help other people. Was that a good thing for me to do, and did I help people? Yeah, I did. But I wasn't cultivating connection with them. They were just an object to me as whatever I was doing as a counselor. They're only concerned about I instead of we. They don't... We is about me too. I is about what I can tell you to do that will help your life get in order again. The safe person has empathy that's supported by realistic, concrete, and, it's really important, need-based action. I don't act if the other person doesn't need me to. I calibrate what I do in terms of another person, in terms of my empathy, according to what they need, not what I need to say so that I feel helpful or I feel profound or I feel like I've got something really good for them to know. That's the danger in a lot of those things. But a lot of the stuff that you say, you might say in this in any given week, in any given day that you talk to somebody, you got to ask yourself a question when you look back at it. Why did I say that? Was it because I was searching for something important to say, or was I saying it because that was what they needed to hear? Now, remember, 
I will always rationalize what the other person needs are according to what I need. I will always rationalize it. I, it, it just happens that way. So the minute I say that, and I said it just a, that minute, I had to add that qualifier because I've had people say, well, they needed it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, maybe. But how did they respond? I, I had that happen in my small group. I had a woman that, and she walked away not liking me very much. I'm sure that surprises most of you. But she, she said something to a single woman. She was mid-40s, unmarried, undivorced. She has not had no, you know, no complications with other marriages or anything like that. And she was talking about how lonely she was. And this other woman decided to pontificate about how Jesus loved her and she was his daughter. Is it true? Yes, it is. Was it what she needed to hear at that moment? No, it wasn't. And I was dumb enough to point that out to her. <clears throat> and my, my wife completely freaks out when I do that because, of course, I'm making people uncomfortable, and she lives her life making sure everybody's comfortable. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, dear, I had to say it. <clears throat> that was part of our conversation last night. <laughs> so we, we sh shifted gears, if you'll notice. I, I didn't bring this to your attention, but we shifted from personal traits to interpersonal traits. All right, so I'll, I'll go back and you'll see what I mean. Because here we were at personal, then we go to interpersonal, void closeness, et cetera. We shifted gears in talking about how do they relate to other people, okay? And they resist freedom instead of encouraging it. They tend to spend a lot of their time controlling what other people think, do, choose, whatever. In a lot of cases, they flatter us without, instead of confronting us. Probably the, the, the one of the most profound qualities of a friend is that they're willing to risk making you mad at the right time. <laughs> Always at the right time. And in a lot of cases, people that are safe will usually preface what they're saying in confronting because remember confronting is not about violence or getting angry or anything like that what we often don't understand is confronting is asking somebody to reconcile their behavior and their beliefs that's that's confrontation <clears throat> so in a lot of cases the safe person is going to say look I've been here, I've, you know, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt and went home. I understand how hard this is, but help me understand what goes into the decision you made to do it this way. That's a confrontation. Does it feel like a confrontation? Usually not. But it is. Interpersonally, they stay in their prescribed role. If they play parent, they're always parent. They're not about flattening the universe and flattening the ground between us that we're standing on the same ground. <clears throat> they are unstable over time. Instead of being consistent, they're always changing their mind about what's true. <clears throat> Most of the time we walk away feeling like we've gotten bludgeoned. Like we're not good enough. Unsafe people trigger shame in us. Instead of walking away, maybe not feeling better, but at least feeling a little bit more confident for one and valued for another. And in a lot of cases, they gossip instead of keeping confidences. <clears throat> See, why, why do people gossip? That's behavior, right? That's downstream. The question is, is what goes on in someone's heart who tends to gossip? And usually it's about power. Usually it's about power. 
is also about playing God. And we have to be clear, and I, and I hope even as we talk about this, is that the wellspring of your new life in Christ was founded in grace, which means that's the spring. But the farther downstream we get, the more legalistic we become, the more shame-based we become, partly because, don't forget, it is built into our spiritual DNA to be, sh- to shame- be shame-based. We don't, want, we don't need to be naive about that. What's remarkable is that when grace starts to take a hold in somebody, they really are fundamentally different. My wife made a comment last night that just kind of stunned me completely because she said, I begin to understand why you are so passionate about talking about this because what you have learned has saved you. And then she clarified it and said, you were saved at 17, but this saved you. That's a profound statement that that she said. And it was like, wow, really? And I, I, I'm not paying attention to that. I'm not. So, how do we figure out whether we're a safe person or not? <clears throat> safe people draw us closer to God because they value freedom and grace. They encourage us to be free. They're willing to risk you being free. Most of the time, we don't like freedom because we don't like what? Making a mistake. And mistakes are fatal. They also draw us closer to connection because they value vulnerability. They value connection And they display empathy. Listen, you cannot display empathy if you haven't explored your own heart. You can speak empathy. You can speak it. You can be trained in every counseling program how to to be empathic. But the basis of empathy is knowing myself well enough to be able to see it in somebody else's landscape, heart landscape, and identify it. That's empathy. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of people come through counseling programs. They're really good at all the counseling techniques. But they believe that it's about the techniques, not about being a person in relationship with another person. And knowing their own heart well enough to be able to connect with another person's heart and what goes on there. And they help us to become the real, authentic person God created us to be. Now, somebody may say, I don't know what that is. Okay. That's part of the discovery, right? So when they're modeling all this behavior, safe people are willing to live in this tension between grace and truth. Because that's it is a tension. Because if it's all truth, there's not a whole lot of compassion. If it's all grace, it's all license. It's like do whatever we're living in that kind of culture today now. And that's some of the reasons why grace has gotten bastardized in its definitions. Because we think it's like winking at sin when it isn't remotely that. So... Obviously, the greatest model of safety is Jesus. Why? John, in the first chapter of John, it talks about the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is probably one of the more profound statements that we fly right by and don't pay much attention to. Because by dwelling with us, He took on flesh and became the empathizing God. The God that says, yeah, me too. Because you dig in far enough, you dig in deep enough to Jesus' story, 
and you fill in gaps for with just logic, okay? Not I'm not trying to go outside of the biblical record or be heretical, although I like kind of doing that now and again. <clears throat> but just think about culturally. Jesus is born out of wedlock. Just that alone. What happens in that culture? The woman is stoned, and the baby probably is too. So he grows up being the bastard child of Joseph and Mary. That's not a reputation you want to walk around with. Right? And so suddenly, Jesus' humanity, not to overemphasize it, and, and again, you got to stay away from dichotomies here. <clears throat> but Jesus' humanity is the thing that makes it dwell amongst us and be in with us. And he was a man full of grace and truth. So dwelling grace and truth are the characteristics of safe people and what we attempt to be. So... How to be safe. We'll start with the easiest one first. <laughs> Learn how to ask for help. There is so much more here than meets the eye. Like I have here, God's, God places a high premium on asking directly for help. Any forms of asking, the word help, ask, appears almost 800 times in the Bible. Many of those times are invitations for us to ask. But what does asking require of us? Understanding our need. And for a lot of us, because of the shame stuff that's going on in our lives, accepting our need is really tough to do because we've been told over and over again having any needs is being needy. So having needs, having a desire to connect, having those needs are now translated into a personal characteristic that is condemned. Well, I don't want to be needy. I don't want to be too much for anybody. <clears throat> so asking for help is is one of those characteristics to say I I somebody God God's brought people into my life maybe somebody here can help me because it recognizes it, it what's behind it is humility it's recognizing my need without condemning my need and turning it into neediness Recognizing my need and asking for help is also owning my needs. When I say that, if I don't ever have any needs, then there's a lot of me that I've already said I, I don't want to respond to. I want to deny. I don't, I don't want to deal with in any way. <clears throat> the other side of that, which is really pretty fascinating, is by recognizing my need and asking for others to help me with that need opens this door, and this fits in with the vulnerability that, that Brown talks about that says vulnerability requires trust, and the way trust is built is with vulnerability. So when I ask for my need to be met and for people to help me, what do I open the door for? to see evidence of people responding to me, which what per, generates gratefulness and gratitude. <clears throat> and then obviously, the basic one, it increases the odds that we'll get some help. The problem is, the problem with this one is, is we sincerely believe that if people really loved me, really cared about me, they would know what I need without me having to tell them. So it becomes a test. I've, I've had people say this to me more times than I can count. Well, what good is that? If I say to somebody I have a need and they respond, what good is that? 
It's like, well, they don't have to. And when they do, they've chosen to. But we want to we we want to te- we want to spend spend this life of testing whether people, whether we really count or not. Which at the core is controlling people into doing things so that we don't have to ask. We don't have to feel what? It's not humility. It's humiliation. Accepting my needs and asking for help is humiliating rather than a building block for humility. <clears throat> Learning to need, like I said, is not the same as being needy. Recognizing that we have needs. We don't we don't think anything of physical needs, okay? I mean, I'm not I'm not going to feel shame or feel embarrassed because I'm hungry. Or I'm not going to feel guilty because I got up this morning and brushed my teeth. Because that's a physical thing. But when it comes to our emotional life, our emotional states, those are shrouded with all of this other statements and messages that puts us in this place of feeling needy. And feeling needy defines our needs. <clears throat> so, sometimes we simply, and, and again, this, this overlaps time and time again with what Brown talks about, is confessing my need, my inability to see or recognize my needs. I will have good enough friends to say, well, why don't you ask? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. <laughs> And don't fake it. Having to keep my boundaries and, and understanding that there are some things I need to take some responsibility for. The best friends are the ones that will point to, this is bigger than you can handle yourself. This is reasonable to ask other people to help you. On the other hand, there are also those kinds of friends that say, you might want to give it a shot yourself before asking. Okay. But they've built up the, the, the credit, if you will, the relational kind of credibility to do that. <clears throat> and there are some needs I, I have to confess that I, I have a hard time experiencing. Like fe- feeling vulnerable. <laughs> Is it a need? I hope by the, by the time at this point you've read enough of Brene Brown to say, yeah, it's the fundamental piece of belongingness. But I have a hard time experiencing that and paying attention to what provokes longing. Sometimes we, we don't because we're afraid of feeling that. Yeah, Kaylin? So when we've been burned by people, yes. we have um, confessed beings like having a need, and they've just kind of been like, well, you are needy. Does that just mean that that is an unsafe person for us and we look for Yes. Yes, but remember, let's not talk about people in, in kind of overarching categories. Because that, you may have done that because he, he or she had displayed some safe characteristics. And at that moment in time, yes, they're being unsafe. Maybe then I look to someone else for that. Or if I'm in that kind of relationship, I might give them that feedback. And you find out again just how safe they are because they, it might actually help them correct. If they're generally pretty safe and you say, ouch, <laughs> and they say, oh, <laughs> I did it again. And then they correct. On the other hand, a lot of times we do that kind of stuff hoping to make people safe. And... That's a whole nother topic, which we will talk about in terms of control. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, hope springs eternal. And we I won't finish it. I don't want to insult anybody. But hope springs eternal. We end up trying to transform people that are close to us into being safe people, even though we have lots and lots of evidence that, that generally speaking, they're probably not real safe. And then, then that gets into a really uncomfortable question about how do I continue in a relationship that somebody with somebody who's generally pretty unsafe? 
well, pretty guardedly and with lots of boundaries, and you look for somebody who is safe enough to be able to to share that. But uh, yeah, I think I think that's the general experience of most people. The problem is, is we keep trying and we keep getting hurt, and then we say it must be because I just can't seem to get this right, versus the other person. It's got some fundamental characteristics here that I want to save, and then I'm in this relationship that I got to be careful that I'm trying to save them when they're trying to just kind of use me. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, so the first time I heard this lecture was probably like a year ago, and then I heard it last semester again with sexuality. Yes. And I like had realized that there were a lot of relationships where I was being an unsafe person mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And so I tried to implement a bunch of the stuff in my life. Mm-hmm. And it's been like honestly so life changing, but also so difficult. Like you always have to be like checking yourself and reminding yourself. And like even recently in situations, I'll like respond in a way that I know was not the way in which a state person should respond mm-hmm. and then I'll like, check myself. Anyways, how do you balance like not feel like forgiving yourself and not feeling shame mm-hmm. when you do go through this stuff and like giving yourself grace? Because then another thing we talked about in human sexuality was like you're ultimately setting us up to disappoint ourselves. <laughs> and then you said no one is consistently safe and so it's like how do you where's the balance and like yeah. trying to achieve all these things and well, you won't. <laughs> you won't. See, yeah, all right. There's the fun part. Um, but I, I, again, you know, I, and this is this is one point that I I categorically, dramatically disagree with Kyle Eidemann on is the whole idea of self forgiveness because that's. That is a never-ending, infinite loop you will never get out of. Okay, I, it's been embedded into a lot of pastors' nomenclature about forgiveness, and quite honestly, I, you can't do that because you're you're trying to make a case to a judge, jury, and executioner who's already convicted you. But and you mix them. You said forgive myself or accept grace. Drop the forgive myself. How do I accept grace? And it's it's looking at these situations when I don't do it quite right and saying and going maybe even going back to the person and say how did that feel to you? And they might say that sucked. And it's like okay, help me, help me. I want to learn. And grace gives me that space to go into that conversation. <clears throat> and it's a a. A, an incredibly uncomfortable one. It's an incredibly uncomfortable one. At the same time, when you get through that conversation, guess what you find? Intimacy with that person. Because they cared enough to hang in with you. Last night with that conversation I had with my wife, it was very uncomfortable for both of us. And we worked it through and continued and, and had dis- dissertions and Things were said and, and, and feedback was given. All that happened. And we finally got to this place of saying, we need some more feedback about this from somebody outside of us. We said, yep, we do. And when I got up to walk away, I made sure that I said to her, thank you for hanging in with me. Because she could have bailed. She could have acquiesced. That was our history. She would have just acquiesced and said, yeah, you're right. Just, yeah, whatever. And it's like, I, I want that to be, because I can't learn any other way. And that's what grace creates this space. That's why I keep using this word, because the grace o- opens this space up so that I don't have to beep the heck out of myself because I didn't do it right. I can stand in on it and say, give me the feedback, let me learn, and I'll give it a shot the next time differently. And then I do it again. And I'll probably get a little better because I've got the target in my mind. But if we make failing a, a fatal thing, it's going to be really hard to learn. Because if failing is fatal, then shame is waiting. 
and that's that's part of that. <clears throat> Any other questions? We're out of time, so I will continue this on Thursday. I'm sure you can't wait. See ya.